Hi there, my name is Nicole Teagle. I'm a family nurse practitioner, and I'm here today to talk with you about some ENT pearls that will help you in primary and urgent care. Some of these may be a review for many of us. Um, however, it's always great to learn a few new things that may help us in our practice with our patients. I do not have any disclosures. After this presentation, I hope that you have reviewed the common ENT conditions that you will see in acute and primary care, that you will remember when to refer patients to an otolaryngologist, and also that we will review the tympanostomy tube criteria and when an adenotonsillectomy should be performed. Let's start with ears. Acute otitis media, one of the most common conditions that we see. Uh, this is a very classic presentation in this picture, a nice bulging eardrum, purulence behind the TM. Um, you may see purulence in the canal if the TM has ruptured. When do you treat with antibiotics? So in severe cases, um, you will go ahead and treat with antibiotics when you have symptoms for at least 48 hours. If it is uh, not a severe case, you may decide that you want to do watchful waiting for the first 48 hours. When it's time for an antibiotic, you will go ahead and use one of the upper respiratory ones. If you have failure to improve at 48 hours, you want to consider changing the antibiotic. In this case, I recommend uh, a follow-up visit in person so you can do otoscopy, actually visualize that tympanic membrane and make sure that there is a true clinical non-improvement. Effusions. Uh, this, again, is a very classic picture with a nice uh, amber effusion there that's very easy to spot. It's not always quite so easy in person. Um, an effusion can be either mucus or serous. You may see some bubbles as the effusion is resolving. Uh, that might be after an acute otitis media. Uh, not uncommon to see an effusion after that. Usually after an acute otitis media, when you see an effusion, uh, these effusions usually resolve within three months. It's uh, not considered a failure until after three months that effusion is still present when you have a documented otitis media. The effusions may be associated with hearing loss and speech delay in pediatrics. It can be related to adenoid hypertrophy. Uh, if the provider is so skilled, they can do pneumatic otoscopy. Um, they can also try tympanometry. However, this is not often something that I have found available when I've worked in primary care and urgent care. I used it very frequently though when I worked in ENT. Uh, Get a formal audiogram. That's always recommended when you see an effusion. The other thing to mention and highlight is that when you see a unilateral effusion in an adult, that is a definite referral to ENT. Those patients need a nasal endoscopy to rule out a nasopharyngeal mass. When do we place tympanostomy tubes? Uh, so three or more episodes of acute otitis media in six months or four or more in 12 months. If you have an effusion for at least three months with speech delay, difficulty hearing, symptoms of eustachian tube dysfunction, if there's a unilateral effusion, that might be observed for six months if there's no speech delay. If the child is at least four years um, or older, uh, when the tubes are placed, the discussion needs to be had, should you also do an adenoidectomy at the time? Um, we will go over when is an adenoidectomy in and of itself indicated, um, but adenoidectomy is because that hypertrophy could contribute to the recurrence and development of otitis media should be thought of when you're going to place tubes. This will change your anesthesia. Um, if you are getting just tubes in a pediatric patient, um, you could do this with mask anesthesia, uh, much lower risk. However, if you're doing an adenoidectomy, you do need um, general sedation, intubation. So this would be a shared discussion with the provider and the parents.
who to refer to ENT. So if there is a failed newborn hearing screen, we'll talk about that in a couple of slides a little bit more. Any children um, with speech or hearing concerns, you wanna order an audiogram and send to ENT. If you have any age patient with a unilateral effusion greater than three months, if there's bilateral effusions in pediatrics, then we're really worried about their hearing and speech development. If they have recurrent otitis media or otitis media that's requiring multiple antibiotics. So maybe they don't have the four that are required for tube placement, but every time they get an otitis media, they're needing three rounds of antibiotics, or they've developed allergies, and they've progressed to only being able to take IM Rocephin, definitely send those patients to ENT for a workup. And then any patient with otitis media and concern for mastoiditis, you want to send as well. Otorrhea. So draining ears could be related to otitis media with a perforated tympanic membrane or a tympanostomy tube. There could be middle ear pathologies such as a cholesteatoma, or it might just be from otitis externa. Uncomplicated otorrhea can be treated with antibiotic drops, um, typically Oflox or Cipro. Uh, these were more of our go-to than cortisporin. Cortisporin was associated with more um, topical irritation. Um, ophthalmic top drops um, were just as they're just as effective as the otic preparations, and usually they're cheaper. If there's any blood noticed in that otorrhea um, by the patient or the provider, be sure to add a steroid to those drops. So you can do Ciprodex. Um, how often, however, sometimes this can be cost prohibitive. So you can um, separate it out. You can do that Ofox and Cipro, do two drops of whichever antibiotic drop is chosen, and then do two drops of a dexamethasone eye drop as well into the ear canals. Usually more than four drops at a time is just too much for the size of the ear canals. And make sure to add an oral antibiotic if there's any concern for mastoiditis or if that odorrhea is failing to improve on drops alone. Those are also both indications for referral to ENT. When there's persistent odorrhea, it's very easy to suction and send some of that for culture. So when are you going to refer these patients to ENT? As we said, persistent otorrhea. Um, if you need suctioning of the debris, this is very easily done in ENT with the assistance of microscopy. Um, if there's any middle ear pathology, any concern for mastoiditis, and then the consistency. So if you have a watery consistency, want to be sure that it's not a CSF leak. Hearing loss. There are two types of hearing loss, conductive or sensory neural. Some patients may have a mix of these with their hearing. You will be able to tell a patient's uh, type of hearing loss and the severity with a formal audiogram. Presbycusis is usually symmetric, as we will talk about in another slide. Um, asymmetric hearing loss, uh, one ear worse than the other, is definitely an indication for a hearing test and need for some exploration. Any concerns for hearing loss in patients, you want to refer for an audiogram. This is usually almost always covered by insurance. Um, patients, though, who are without insurance, it can get a little trickier if they don't have the financial means to pay for it out of pocket. Um, Costco is an option. Um, patients will get an, a hearing test as part of a workup for hearing aids at Costco. However, they are not obliged to purchase the hearing aids from them. Uh, Weber and Renee with a tuning fork, those are great tools in primary care. I use them on almost every patient that has some type of otologic complaint and always recommend to patients the hearing protection. The newborn hearing screen. This is important to review with any 
pediatric patients who have come present, you know, with an otologic concern. Did they pass their newborn hearing screen? If they fail to, they will need an auditory brainstem reflux test. This is something that can be ordered um, through audiology and ENT, so no worries there. Just referring them to ENT can get that ball rolling to do that. Asymmetric hearing loss. So this is always a red flag. There are cases when there is a possible origin, uh, perhaps patients are hunters and don't use hearing protection. So they have one ear that is exposed to noise on a continual basis more than the other. Maybe there is a past military exposure. Um, these were things that I saw in you know my time during ENT where we did have a reason for it. However, um, patients with asymmetric loss should always be referred a hearing test referred to ENT, they will still need, even if we think we have a reason for it, they will still need a workup for retrocochlear pathology. Um, the most common thing, and it's still not very frequent, but it still would be the most common reason we would see this uh, would be an acoustic neuroma. Most of the time, the retrocochlear pathology workup is there no reason there's nothing found um but still missing an acoustic neuroma would be tragic uh the imaging of choice for this would be an mri of the intraauditory canals don't feel the pressure to order this ent can always do that um but that would be what what would you be used to rule out the retrocochlear pathology sudden sensory neural hearing loss this is something I became quite passionate about working in ENT. Um, this is typically a unilateral, sudden, profound hearing loss. The patient often also had a roaring tinnitus in that ear. Um, these patients sometimes would just say they woke up like this, or maybe they would just happen in the midst of their afternoon. The best chance of these patients recovering some of their hearing is in those first two weeks. However, I often would see these patients months down the line. They would wait a few weeks, go to their primary care, they'd be told to try some Sudafed, maybe some Flonase, and then come to ENT six months later where there was very little we could do for them to make an appreciable benefit. The goal for these patients is usually salvage. Uh, the likelihood that appreciable recovery to the hearing can be made is pretty low. What we are trying to do is make them a candidate for amplification. That profound loss that they experience is often unaidable. Um, they are only about sometimes 10, 20% able to use a hearing aid, even with that loss. So if we can get the ability to aid them with amplification closer to 70, 80%, that would be the goal. And those patients, excuse me, on the previous slide, um, the treatment for them is usually high dose oral steroids or even intratympanic steroids. So ringing in the ears, this is usually associated with hearing loss. It's often permanent. However, there are certain things that can exacerbate the ringing. So patients who go to a fireworks show or go to a Chinese buffet that increase salt, um, stress, poor sleep, caffeine, those things can also exacerbate the ringing. So by avoiding the things that make it worse, in a sense, that gives patients sometimes some control over their ringing. Um, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction can also make it worse. If a patient complains of unilateral ringing or pulsatile ringing, you definitely want to send those patients to ENT for a workup as well. Okay, let's move on to noses. First, let's just review the basic nasal anatomy. Um, the nose has three sets of turbinates. The most uh, visible ones are your inferior turbinates. They're rather large hanging down on the inside of that nasal vestibule there. Um, they can hypertrophy and grow with allergic exposures, but those are normal anatomical um, 
findings in the in on a nasal exam. Um, I had referrals several times when I was ENT for masses within the nose that were the inferior turbinates. So everyone should have inferior turbinates. Um, the size of them, however, may vary based on um, their own intrinsic factors and allergic responses. Epistaxis, um, usually it is coming from the anterior aspect of the nose right there in kesal box plexus. There's just a huge convergence of vessels there. That mucosa is so very thin, so easily irritated. Um, it can be just from digital trauma, rhinorrhea, foreign bodies, um, intranasal drug use. Uh, keep the nares moisturized. So this can be done with the air nasal gel or regular petroleum jelly. Um, using a humidifier is a, a good recommendation for these patients. Patients can use Afrin for acute bleeds. Be sure to review with them the proper technique. How many times have you seen a patient that has a nosebleed and they're sitting there pressing on their nasal bones? So make sure they blow out those clots, spray that Afrin in there copiously, and then they're pinching on the, the lower nasal walls um, and hold it for 15 minutes. Don't budge. Patients who have refractory bleeds may need some silver nitrate or electrical cautery. Uh, it may even progress to the point that they need to get a nasal tampon. Um, antibiotics are not needed unless the patient keeps that tampon in for over three days. So when should you refer a patient with bloody noses to ENT? So if they're having recurrent episodes, if it's a bleed from the posterior aspect, if the patient's on anticoagulants, those patients can be so very difficult um, to control the bleed. And then um, if they have nasal packing, obviously. Sinusitis, this especially in the winter time is so very common. So in children, the sinuses are either absent or poorly developed. As they grow, they will go ahead and develop their sinuses. Typically, sinusitis is viral at onset. Antibiotics should not be considered until they have purulent rhinorrhea that has lasted for at least 10 days. Chronic symptoms would be when it has lasted for three months, and the mainstay of treatment for chronic sinusitis is the nasal irrigation and topical steroids. In pediatric patients, you want to also rule out adenoiditis. Um, this would be uh, possibly contributing to their acute otitis media episodes, um, but this would be something to also consider. These patients may have facial pain or pressure. They may have a decreased sense of smell, um, but the number one thing they should have is the prevalent rhinorrhea. If it is clear, if they um, don't have rhinorrhea, those patients should not be treated with antibiotics. Don't be afraid to do watchful waiting to recommend just nasal irrigation with a topical steroid. Sinus sex rays are not very helpful. The sinus CT is the most useful imaging if you're going to order imaging. Acute treatment, as I mentioned a few times, so the nasal irrigation, neti pot, uh, the Neal Med sinus rinse bottle is very popular. Topical steroids, whichever one the patient uh, can tolerate. If they complain of irritation, make sure the technique is appropriate. Are they pointing it out uh, towards the side of the nose, away from that septum? Um, oral or short course of topical decongestants may be uh, also utilized. Just be sure if you're using Afrin, uh, limit it to the three days just to avoid the rhinitis medicamentosa. Um, antibiotics would be indicated, as I mentioned, if you have symptoms for greater than 10 days or with double sickening. Patients who have polyps are going to need oral steroids until they can have surgery. Um, that is just the mainstay. And they'll probably, after their polypectomy, need to be on topical steroids indefinitely. When should you refer these patients to ENT? So persistent rhinorrhea in pediatrics, it'll need to be determined, is this true sinusitis or is it from the adenoids? Adults, um, three to four sinus infections a year are normal. So when they exceed that, and be sure when you refer them that they are doing nasal irrigation.
just remember plain films are not very helpful. The CT scan is what should be considered for recurrent episodes. It will also be often used in surgical planning. Allergic rhinitis. So the rhinorrhea, the post-nasal drip, the sneezing, the itchy nose and eyes. The mainstay for this is also daily nasal rinses. You want to wash away those irritants from the nasal tissue followed by some topical steroids or topical antihistamines. There's also the combination dimista and then recommending oral second generation antihistamines. Uh, patients who are resistant to this regimen should be referred for allergy testing. And then uh, just a mention for vasomotor rhinitis or chronic rhinitis um, can trial atrovent nasal spray for those patients. So the adenoids, um, typically this is more of a pediatric concern. Um, the hypertrophy for the adenoids, it can cause chronic rhinorrhea. Uh, typically that is purulent. So the kids that just have a constant green and yellow nasal drainage, they have nasal congestion, mouth breathing, um, that adenoid facies where they just sit there just kind of... <sighs> Just, just breathing so heavily through their mouth, um, and they very often will snore. Uh, the symptoms may clear with antibiotics, but then come right back. Um, and as we have talked about a few times, so these may be associated, this may be associated with an acute otitis media or with effusions that hypertrophy can either throw um, that purulence right up the eustachian tube contributing to the otitis media, or it can block the eustachian tubes, um, keeping an effusion in place. So the adenoidectomy should be considered when you have chronic or cyclic symptoms. Um, as I mentioned, it does require intubation for this, uh, but the recovery is minimal. Kids are usually out of school for a day and right back to their normal, um, their normal pattern the next day. So the throat. As most of us uh, know, we grade tonsil size. Um, on a scale of one to four, or they may be absent if they've been removed. Four means they are touching at midline. Um, we have uh, acute tonsillitis with infections. We can have chronic tonsil issues, which would be non-strep um, positive tonsillitis, lesser sore throats, the tonsil stones that develop in those crypts that are pretty um, malodorous, uh, contributing to halitosis. And then another common thing um, that tonsil complaint in ENT would be a peritonsillar abscess. And that should be considered with any patients that have unilateral tonsillar swelling, the palate may be swollen, and they should have pretty significant throat pain. So for just overgrowth of those tonsils, the hypertrophy. This is associated with sleep apnea. So the snoring with pauses in the breathing, waking up gasping for breath, restless sleeping. Um, this is an indication for uh, a tonsillectomy. Um, depending on the provider in the facility, they may not require a sleep study if there's a good history for pediatric patients. Usually adult patients, a uh, sleep study is recommended. This is a great picture of a peritonsillar abscess. You can see um, that swelling there to the tonsil, to the palate. It's kind of kicked that uvula over to the left side. It's those patients usually are talking like they have that muffled marble voice. Uh, they'd rather spit in a cup than swallow. If you press on that fullness with a tongue depressor, it's going to be fluctuant. It should be drained with needle aspiration or an incision and drainage, and that will usually give them immediate relief because it's very, very painful. These are often polymicrobial. So the patient may have even come into your office and had a strep test that was negative. So if it's a negative strep test, we usually don't treat with antibiotics, right? But this progressed because it was polymicrobial. So, um, a antibiotic such as Aventin, Clinda, um, probably even a steroid burst um, would be appropriate for these patients, but go ahead and do an urgent referral to ENT so they can drain that.
tonsillectomy. So indications for tonsillectomy would be seven episodes of strep in a year, um, chronic tonsillitis, which would be like we reviewed those non-strep positive sore throats, tonsil stones uh, with the halitosis um, that has gone on for three or more months, and then sleep apnea, a history of a peritonsillar abscess, because those patients are going to be more prone to getting another peritonsillar abscess, and then periodic fever syndrome. Tonsillectomies in children that are less than three years of age are usually done in a hospital setting with um, a 23-hour observation. However, if they're over three years old and, and adults, those can be done outpatient. It's a pretty predictable, painful 10-day recovery period. Um, children less than six years of age usually manage very well with Tylenol and ibuprofen, um, but Older kids, teens, and adults very often require narcotics for this recovery period. Um, hydration is so crucial. Um, if these patients are not voiding at least three times a day, they should be referred for IV hydration. Being dehydrated is going to increase their pain, but it will also put them at risk for a peritonsillar bleed. That risk for perioperative bleeding um, intensifies with dehydration. It's always an emergency. So any bleeding in a post-op patient should be sent to the emergency room or the ENT office, depending on the protocol. And the post-op otalgia is very common. It was one thing I always made part of my exam for these post-op patients was to check their ears just because the common complaint um, of, I think I have an ear infection as well, um, just with the nerves there. So when should you refer to ENT? So when you think a tonsillectomy might be indicated, if you have recurrent tonsillitis, um, same thing as with ears also. So if you have um, treatment-resistant tonsillitis, so it's requiring multiple rounds of antibiotics, or if you have a peritonsillar abscess. Globus, this is the foreign body sensation in the throat. You want to think about the anatomy for the area at which the patient feels the sensation. This might be from reflux. Um, this might be from irritation from post-nasal drip. It can be very tricky to try to... Um, to try to manage this one. You really need to do a flexible laryngoscopy in these patients. So um, referring to ENT for this. Other red flags would be if your patient is a male, a smoker, over the age of 60, has had recent unintentional weight loss. And if they feel that globus um, more on one side than the other, um, that's definitely an urgent ENT referral. Um, foreign bodies. So this was uh, a common thing that I saw in ENT. Um, so foreign bodies in the nose, very often associated with a very malodorous purulence. Um, you can attempt to flush these out or manually extract them. Ear foreign bodies can be very tricky, um, as long as it's not a bean um, or something else that might swell, you can attempt to flush it um, or manually extract it. I find this one is maybe a little bit easier to do in the ENT setting with the assistance of microscopy. If you are able to extract it, make sure you do appropriate coverage if there is any type of purulence or bleeding after the removal of the foreign body. Um, anything in the throat, you're going to need a flexible laryngoscopy. So if it's there or if you're unable to get it out on your own, um, definitely send the patient to ENT. Uh, just wanted to briefly touch on a UP3. Um, so this is a very aggressive tonsillectomy, so to speak. Um, it also includes removal of the posterior aspect of the soft palate and uvula, and often um, also has a reduction of the base of tongue if it's bulky. So this is done for patients who fail or cannot tolerate CPAP. Um, this is only for patients with mild sleep apnea, and it's not curative. It will treat it for a period of time, um, but it may, the sleep apnea may uh, return. So really recommending CPAP as the first line, that is just the best solution um, and treatment for sleep apnea.
Another thing that was seen multiple times a day in ENT was temporomandibular joint dysfunction. There is a huge overlap in the symptoms um, that were ENT related just because of the approximation. So that TMJ um, goes right up to that ear canal. So jaw pain, otalgia, itching, clicking, popping in the ear, fullness, um, all of those, and it may be even also associated with some neck tension and pain um, can be associated with temporomandibular joint dysfunction. So if the patient is complaining of significant otalgia and their ear canal looks great, there's no sign of infection, they don't have an upper respiratory infection, um, consider TMJD, especially if they say that the ear pain is more prominent with chewing. These patients often clench and grind. So look for wear on the teeth, um, look for scalloped edges on the tongue, check the insides of their cheeks. Uh, recommending an over-the-counter bite guard, just those ones that they can put in warm water and make a mold of their mouth. They want to preferably the ones that don't just protect the teeth, but that immobilize the bite. Um, Anti-inflammatories with food, if those are not contraindicated, and then warm compresses over those um, TMJs a couple times a day and refer them to a dentist to make sure there's no malalignment, um, that their bite is um, appropriate. Virtual considerations. I felt like this slide was necessary because right now we are seeing more patients than ever virtually. So many ENT things can be very difficult without otoscopy. Um, Never hesitate to recommend an in-person exam when the patient is complaining of otalgia without a preceding sinusitis or otorrhea. Um, free, patients who have frequent ear complaints or frequent otitis media may want to invest in a digital otoscope. They can then send you pictures. They can send you videos of what um, they're seeing at home, and this can aid in our virtual exams. You want to teach the parents and patients how to use tissue spheres for otorrhea. So you'll take um, a square of toilet tissue or a Kleenex, and you're going to just twist it, um, and you can twist it in the ear um, to help remove that otorrhea, no more than about an inch. And so you'll twist it around, remove the tissue, and then repeat until you have gotten all you know, until your spears are coming out pretty clean looking. Um, because when you're trying to treat that odorrhea with the drops, it's obviously not going to work as well when the canal is just filled with that purulence. Um, you can, as we have talked about, treat that odorrhea virtually, but recommend that the patient is seen in person, um, especially if you're not sure is this drainage from an acute otitis media with a perforation, um, or is this an otitis externa? We know otorrhea can be treated with drops, but don't you know? Don't hesitate to recommend that in-person follow-up for um, checking, you know, the source of the etiology and making sure that everything has healed appropriately. There's a great app. It's called the Mimi Hearing Test app. It's free um, for patients to test their hearing on their smartphone. It obviously is not an audiogram, um, but it can give you an idea if the patients had a recent change in hearing um, to be able to see what possibly is going on until they can get their formal audiogram. So in conclusion, otitis media, that is going to be your purulence in the middle space. You'll follow those guidelines that we have for antibiotics. Effusions are fluid, mucus, or seroid fluid, and antibiotics are not going to change that. Um, for otorrhea, you can use those antibiotic drops for purulence, add a steroid if there's bleeding. Um, never hesitate to order an audiogram in patients. Make sure to act quickly for sudden sensory neural hearing loss. We know that that first two weeks is our best chance of getting an appreciable recovery. You want to teach the patient's proper technique for treating nosebleeds. Make sure that any patients with sinusitis complaints are doing nasal irrigation. In pediatric patients with sinusitis, uh, consider adenoiditis. Know your indications for tonsillectomy and when to refer those patients for a workup to ENT. And for patients with persistent globus, uh, those patients should also be referred for a flexible laryngoscopy. 
Don't forget to consider temporal mandibular joint dysfunction for otologic complaints. And eye drops can be used in the ears and they are cheaper. And lastly, don't be afraid to not prescribe. Um, watchful waiting can be very appropriate. You can recommend nasal irrigation and a topical steroid um, and have the patient follow up with, you know, in a day or two, or even a few weeks, uh, depending on what the complaint is. But don't be afraid to hold off on prescribing antibiotics. Here are my references. I hope that you found something uh, of use from this presentation. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me.